Well, welcome back, everybody. So today we're talking to a member of the Cal I'm sorry, the Colorado Academy of Physician Assistants. And uh, we're talking to Alan Welchel, who is a physician assistant. And I'm just going to go ahead and let her introduce herself and tell you about her role with Kappa. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Alan. I am a PA, as, as just mentioned. So I am currently past president with the Colorado Academy of PAs. Uh, we have a three-year term. So this is coming into the last two and a half years of, of my term. Um, so that's how I, uh, that's what I'm doing right now. I really got involved about four or five years ago, and it really was because of legislative advocacy that I started mm -hmm. um, started getting involved. I've always been a member of my state chapter for uh, many years now, uh, but uh, just really wanted, and it was the right time for me with family obligations and work obligations to really dive in, and, and so I did. Great. So I did. Yeah. So just quickly, if we can go, like, your background, how long have you been practicing, and how did you, I don't know, why did you decide to become a PA? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, so I've been a PA since 2000, and I went to the University of New England in Biddeford, Maine. Um, you know, my father is a physician, my aunt is a physician, my husband is actually a physician. I've had physicians in my family um, dating back to probably 16, 1700s in this country. So medicine has always been a part of my world and sort of worldview and giving back and, and advocacy. So I was exploring options after college. I was a ski bum for a couple of years, which was super fun. <laughs> and then, uh, and then I, I really have always been drawn to medicine and I was looking for the right fit for me. I did a lot of informational interviewing with healthcare professionals and really just settled on the PA profession. Um, I was not at a point where I wanted to devote seven years to taking care of patients. So mm -hmm. I, I was, I looked at the PA profession and things kind of came together. My advisor at college told me to do this. My father, who's a physician, told me to do this. I met so many great people who were doing it. And mm -hmm. I just really felt like it was the right fit for me. And then I fortunately got into PA school. So I was, I was lucky. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason why we're meeting today is you and I connected because I recently learned how Colorado is getting ready to present legislation to the floor for vote next month that'll grant PAs a little bit more autonomy. So could you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, so, um, you know, each state is unique in their legislative needs and really PA practice and medical practice is dictated at the state level. So that's where we need to make changes for our profession. Uh, Colorado is a large rural population, and as a leader of an organization, people do reach out to you, and uh, we've been hearing a lot of stories about PAs who cannot practice the way that they need to to take care of patients because of the current laws in Colorado. Mm -hmm. So that's really where it came from. Um, we survey our members every year, and this is something that's very important to our members, uh, making this change for legislation. So that's really where this is coming from, and then there's just an huge national movement to really modernize PA practice. Uh, and the states around us have done that. So we felt like it was time for Colorado. It's what the PAs wanted. And, and it's really what we need to do in the new healthcare team-based environment to be able to take care of people. Okay. So, so when, let's just say if the bill were to pass, um, what would that grant the PAs in terms of their, I guess, increased autonomy? Yeah. And I, I would say that we're not really even looking to increase autonomy. We're trying to just be able to do what we're trained to do. Mm -hmm. um, so we all have these skill sets that are currently being limited by this one-on-one -on -one tether with one supervising physician. Mm -hmm. So what it'll do in Colorado, one of the uh, concerns that we have is, as everybody knows, if you have one supervising physician, you're in a small practice and that physician leaves, sometimes that PA loses their job if they can't replace that physician. Mm -hmm. And that, that really is happening in Colorado, and it's happened in, in a lot of states. So we're hoping um, with this new legislation that the, the collaboration or that relationship will not just be with a physician, but will also be able to be with the employer. Mm -hmm. So that will allow the employer to make some of those decisions and hopefully be able to let the PA have more uh, ability to do what they're trained to do. Great. And, so I know, like I said, I learned about this through a student of mine who yeah. mentioned that Colorado was trying to pass some legislation. And I'd read that it was 
actually went to a vote this year, but it was it was defeated. So yeah. why do you think or I mean, I know I've listened to some of the <laughs> um, the discussions on the floor. So, I mean, I have my own opinion of why we, it did not pass. But what do you feel were some of the obstacles? Yeah, so I will start by just reminding everybody that legislation is a marathon um, and it takes a long time to get where you need to go and that's okay. Nobody should be able to go in to the state house and make laws willy nilly um, for their own personal interests. And mm -hmm. this is not about our personal interests. This is about patient care, but it, it's okay that we're careful. Um, mm -hmm. It is frustrating, <laughs> but it's okay. Um, so the reason I think uh, is that legislators are not necessarily in the healthcare arena. They don't really understand some of the nuances of what we do and who we are and, and really what we're capable of. Um, and they tend to listen to the people who they have relationships with. Um, and they're trying to also take care of their constituents. So we, um, as everyone who is involved in this arena knows, there is a lot of opposition from the American Medical Society, American Medical Association. There's some opposition coming from physician groups and physician groups have a lot of influence in the legislature. Mm -hmm. So that's most of the reason why I think that our bill didn't pass. Um, and some of it is just purely education. They really mm -hmm. don't have a good grasp of who we are and, and, and what we're doing and what we're trying to do. Everybody loves PAs. They all see PAs, but they may not really understand the nuance of it. Sure. Yeah. I, I liked your comparison or your analogy to it being a marathon. I think <laughs> you and I, when we talked, I had a little <laughs> bit of experience in this. When I, I live in Texas, but when I was in California, I'd mentioned to you, we had uh, the DMV form, which allows for a handicap placard. On the mm -hmm. California form, you could have a doctor sign it, a DO, a nurse practitioner. You could have an optometrist. And the one that really got me, and no offense to anybody, but there was, you, you could be a religious practitioner and mm -hmm. sign this, but not a PA. Mm -hmm. And I, this was back in the day, I was very ignorant to how legislation works. I, I called the governor's office and said, hey, can you just fix this? And, you know, whoever I spoke to, they're like, well, it doesn't exactly work that way. You need to, you know, go through the process. So fortunately, I had a friend who's a state senator and he authored the bill presented it he was actually pretty excited because he thought oh this just slam dunk this will get passed and exactly. i get to have something next to my name saying i passed legislation yep. and then he called me and said hey i'm sorry it was defeated they would not let it pass I, what and yep. there were certain groups some of what you mentioned who were opposed to it and i it just it's a little silly when i think of i can write for percocet yeah. or fentanyl uh i can discharge a patient from the hospital admit a patient to the hospital but I can't sign a handicap placard, yeah. but it, it took three years. So they reintroduced it the next year, defeated, reintroduced it. Ultimately, the side that was opposing us, they wanted something passed and they came and literally said, we'll let this go through if you'll agree with ours. Mm -hmm. And yes, it is a marathon and that's how it works. Yeah, and, and just for some perspective too, um, APRNs, nurse practitioners, have full practice authority in Colorado, and that went through in 2019 as part of a sunset legislation, which we can discuss if you choose. <laughs> but um, uh, it took them it took them 10 to 15 years and multiple stepwise approach to get to full practice authority. So um, that is just the way things go, and. You know, some of the states have been very fortunate, but anytime you see legislation passed, you need to assume there's been three to five years on the back end mm -hmm. getting that piece of legislation to the finishing line. And um, that's just the way it is. So well, go ahead and do tell me about the sunset thing. You're oh, sure. So sunset legislation, every bill, there are some bills that sunset and, and sunset legislation is a time where you can review the current legislation and then make changes as appropriate because things do evolve, especially in medicine, things do evolve. And a lot of times they'll, the piece of legislation that you may want might be incorporated into a larger bill that has other provisions. So sometimes that's a good time to make changes when it's gonna happen anyway. So um, sometimes. <laughs> well, 
I mean, I think, again, you and I talked, and I, I'm a firm believer that's exactly what happened. So you're aware, like in 2020, uh, December 2020, the president signed legislation that really had to do with COVID relief. But there was a, out of 5,362 pages, there was one, two sentence line says, PAs can now bill Medicare. And I, it was signed December 30th. I can only imagine that there were a lot of people absent, not around. It needed to be signed, the relief bill for COVID. And it just got slid in there because they've been trying to pass that legislation for, you know, ever since I've been practicing. I, I've talked to APA members and it's just been a very arduous task to get PAs the ability to build Medicare, which again, nurse practitioners do enjoy. But I, I feel like that's helped give us this opportunity to get a little bit more autonomy or, you know, maybe help pass legislation what you're trying to get through. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And, and I will tell you that AAPA has been working on that in the background mm -hmm. for years, um, years at the national level. And so they're sort of managing a lot of the national level and then the states do the, the state level. Right. But yes, um, that is huge because now um, independent you know, contractors and then this also really affects some rural health care entities who were not able to build certain parts of Medicare because mm -hmm. of this, and now they can't. So this is, it's a huge piece of legislation. Um, it is. And anytime you pass PA positive legislation that helps push our profession forward, even getting your name on a DMV form, mm -hmm. that is so impactful and it builds upon itself. Um, so it's really, really important to do that. It's really important. Despite other people who may argue against PAs being granted more authority, it does not affect anything. And no. I mean, I know we talked about this and famously, like when I listened to the arguments against the Colorado legislation, there was a person <laughs> who said how this is going to put people's lives at risk. And that's a little over the top. I mean, I, I really, my, my ability to build Medicare does not put anybody's life at risk. And then certainly to have a little bit more well, in your turn, like you said, this is not, this is just allowing PAs to practice the way they're supposed to practice. Right. And um, I think, too, that's that's such a disingenuous argument. And I think it's at such a basic level, too. It's it's sort of implying that we are subpar providers and that we are not highly trained, that we're not intelligent, that we're not able to make uh, reasonable decisions in the healthcare arena, that we don't reach out when we need help, that we're not really team-based, which is could not be farther mm -hmm. from the PA mentality. Uh, I mean, I'm an educator, I'm a PA educator. That, that is not what we teach. Um, so it's just, uh, yeah. And I, I think with, with politicians, if I may digress a moment, <laughs> mm -hmm. with politicians, I think we have to remember that they are they are regular people just like us, right? They're teachers, they're construction people, they own businesses. Um, there's one or two, maybe one or two lawyers, maybe there may be some healthcare providers, maybe. Um, so their main objective is to do good work for the people that they're representing. Mm -hmm. But in order to do that good work, they have to be elected, and they have to get reelected. Right. And in order to do that, they need money. And this is the system that we're working within. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes when you hear things in the legislative arena, they're very adamant and very forceful. They're, they're trying to sort of make their point and uh, make a splash so that mm -hmm. they get noticed and that people <laughs> will reelect them and that their fundraisers and people who support them financially are, are uh, hearing what they're saying. So that is some of it. <laughs> It is. And I, I think this goes back to what you had said earlier. It's sometimes just a lack of understanding. You know, yeah. A lot of the other legislators, of course, are not healthcare professionals. So they're not in this field. And when you have certain people of organizations who come out and say the things that they do, which are very well rehearsed, I would just say, and they say <laughs> things that are very visceral. I mean, I'm, yeah. again, I'm going to go back to putting people's lives at risk. People hear yeah. that and think, wow, I don't certainly... As you said, you have to get reelected. I don't want to be responsible for voting for something that's putting people's lives at risk, which, as you said, that's, you know, it, it's it's not even an exaggeration. It's just such a gross misrepresentation yes. of our profession. Yes. You talk about, you know, asking for help. You know, 
I think of all the doctors that I have worked with throughout my career, and they too yes. have to ask for help. I've never met anybody who worked in medicine who was too good at their job. Right. You're just never good enough. Uh, I mean, no, you are good enough, but you can always be better. You can always get better at what you're doing. Um, and, you know, I've been doing this for a long time and, and I completely agree with you. Uh, the one asset that you really have as a provider is your, your friends and other specialties who you can call to get advice when you need help. And mm -hmm. everybody needs help. Uh, you don't want a cardiologist replacing your knee and you certainly don't want an orthopedic surgeon managing your congestive heart failure. Right. So, <laughs> I mean, everyone needs help and it's, it's just, that's just not the way medicine works. Uh, you're never in a vacuum. And then some of the other things I would say I heard during these arguments against the bill were how PAs, I don't know, there's this conception that we provide like a low cost, mm -hmm. uh, some, some like, I don't, I'm trying to think of the words they actually use, but it was like a lower cost, um, provide health care and i again when you have other people the legis other legislators who are not in medicine don't understand yeah. you know the insurance company does not reimburse at a lower rate because medicare doesn't reimburse at a lower rate because i'm providing the service it's still the same so yeah. this is not the patient's not getting a discount so it's not like i i'm a budget provider <laughs> there's the top tiered MD or maybe DO provider. But if you, you want to go to a less expensive than maybe go see a PA. No, I mean, my education costs almost the same. And, you know, the service, I always tell my students that I'm working with, I don't look at an x-ray any differently than the doctor does. No. I don't read an EKG differently. If the urinalysis comes back and it's positive for infection, I don't prescribe different antibiotics. <laughs> I don't uh, order physical therapy for my patients differently. I don't perform, you know, a, an examination differently. I mean, right. just because I went through PA school doesn't mean that they only taught me half of the medications that are out there. It's not a discount. It's not a budget provider or this. No, uh, no and I think, um, yeah, and they, they sometimes will sort of use that to perpetuate this idea that you're getting less than when you see a PA. But the reality is we're held to the same standard of care. Uh, malpractice is malpractice is malpractice. Yes. <laughs> um, there's no difference and nobody will tell you that there is. Uh, mm -hmm. There's the same checks and balances. Uh, you know, the Board of Medicine oversees PAs and physicians. Uh, so there's the same, there's the same, everything's the same for us. Um, that's why it's it's just so disingenuous to say that, but they do they do sometimes use that to sort of imply that you're getting worse care if you go see right. a PA. And and that was some of the testimony too. I don't know if you picked up on that, but yes, they love to say that we're creating a two tiered system for people in rural areas, and they always tie that to access to care. But I think we all know in reality that. Uh, everybody has access to care issues. In Denver, it takes three to six months to get into a neurologist. Mm -hmm. It takes three to six months to get into an endocrinologist. So it's, it's just not, it's just not true. It's, it's not a substandard sort of tiered level of care. Um, well, I would say also there was one of the person arguing against, um, more or less said that this person had PAs and even their PAs, she had seen how they had missed things or had, you know, maybe missed something on, a, on an examination or sure. on, on a test. And to that, I simply just say, you, you're the one that's supposed to be training them. So that, that sort of reflects back on you. It's not the PA didn't, because just like a doctor, I mean, my sister's an OBGYN, but she wasn't ready to be an OBGYN right out of medical school. She had to go through residency. Awesome. And when a PA, you hire that PA, yep. that's a residency. And so if that PA is making a mistake, that's not, I'm not saying it's all on the MD's fault, but you, that person also bears some responsibility. Maybe yep. you need to spend some time and explain what it is that you learn and know just as much as 
any of the surgeons that I've worked with, again, it's collaborating with your fellow colleagues. Uh, but I wouldn't just uh, impugn PAs to say, well, this person made a mistake. And again, it's the less training that they receive. No, I don't think that's true. And um, I also would challenge anyone who's in the medical field to talk to anyone they know uh, five years out, 10 years out, 20 years out, and ask them if they've made a mistake that week. Sure. Um, this is medicine. It's really, really challenging. You are not perfect and you never will be. Um, that is why you ask for help. Yeah. And so, so I think um, this is, an, and just, we have chosen in Colorado to stay above board. Uh, we do not dig in the dirt. We do not call names. We do not point out the untruths in their story. We don't talk about all the bad things physicians have done, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> you can. <laughs> so um, that's kind of how we've decided to do it. Uh, and oh. I, I think you know, yeah, you have to draw the line somewhere. You have to be an ethical person, mm -hmm. you know? So one of the things I had uh, mentioned or I was going to ask you about was like for other states, because this is starting to gain a little momentum. And what would you recommend for other state organizations yeah. that are thinking about trying to pursue legislation like this? I think that the first team, the first thing I would recommend is sort of learn who your team is and who you have uh, to work on this because it's it takes a long time. Um, and that's really your best asset is the people you have. Um, the second thing is to learn what your state laws currently are. You need to know where you're starting from and you need to have a little bit of an understanding of some of the relationships or some of the stakeholders, we call them in legislation. These are the people that your legislation would potentially impact. So you need to have an understanding of that uh, an understanding of where those relationships are. Um, and then, I think it's very, very powerful to canvas your membership and see what your membership wants because the state chapters are constituent organizations of the AAPA first, but we are membership driven organizations. Mm -hmm. So in Colorado, we know that our PAs want this, but you need, you need to have that basis of, of what's going on. And then it's about really assembling your team. You do need a lobbyist to do this work. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to see where your finances are as a chapter, you need to assemble your team with lobbyists, and you need to kind of uh, see who you know who has experience in this, because I guarantee you there's someone in your state who's been doing legislation at some mm -hmm. level. Yep. So kind of get that team together. And then um, I always say go for it, right? We went for it for two years, mm -hmm. and now we're at a position where we may be changing a little bit of our focus, but you just never know what you're going to get. Um, and so really just trying to go for it. And I also, um, probably the other state chapters are annoyed with me, but I cold call everybody and mm -hmm. ask them, how did you do it? What was successful? What would you recommend? Just gathering that information and data yep. so that you are more informed yourself and have, have some ideas. What could, um, some of the other PAs in Colorado or even the, the pre PA students, what are things that they could do to help out? Cause I'm sure, I mean, obviously you have a lot of constituents within your organization, but maybe for some of them that are not members, because mm -hmm. we, we talk to people quite frequently or PAs and PA students who aren't even aware that this sort of legislation is even right. happening in other states or throughout the country. So what could they do to help you out? So I think the main thing, honestly, is to join your state chapter. And it's very inexpensive for uh, pre-PAs and then join AAPA. Uh, we, as an organization, do not have a magic list of all the PAs in Colorado. We don't have your email addresses. We don't have your information. So if you want to stay in touch with what's happening, and I'll tell you, the state organizations are really the only ones running PA positive legislation. Mm -hmm. So if you want to know what they're doing, you sort of have to give them access to your information so they can actually contact you. Um, and I think the other thing that is really, really important is to, especially as a pre-PA, learn about the profession, do a little bit of research. Uh, I can tell you on applications, I can tell which PA pre-PAs really know about PAs and which maybe don't know as much. Um, so you, it comes through, it comes through on applications. <laughs> so, and I'm impressed. When people really know about the profession, I'm impressed on applications. It's meaningful to me. Um, 
So I think join for sure join. And then the other thing that I cannot stress enough is reach out to your legislators. They are literally your kindergarten teacher. They are literally the person who works in the local store. They are like us. They want to hear from you. They, the one thing that legislators really want is to hear from their constituents. And if you can reach out, you can call, you can set up a meeting and you can tell them about the PA profession, give them a real person and a real uh, story to attach to our profession. That is so powerful. Mm -hmm. So that is one thing I would definitely recommend because um, they're hearing from other people who are telling them about PAs who are not PAs. So they need to hear from PAs. They need to hear from you why it's important to do this work and pass this legislation. Like how would it impact you? What do you need to do? So I've been thinking about this a lot as you move into the advocacy arena and, and being a PA educator. And I, I just don't know where that disconnect is for our profession between this really powerful advocacy piece of knowing who we are, what's our identity, what's important to us. Um, and I think it's changing now. A lot of students do pick PA as their primary goal when they start mm -hmm. college. Um, and there's pre-PA societies and, and things like that, but um, just really keeping people engaged and active. We are so powerful. There are 150,000 mm -hmm. of us and we are in every single medical arena. And let us not forget that we are money-making entities for mm -hmm. every place we work in. So I think PA should have a voice everywhere, beyond every board, every leadership committee, um, everywhere that anyone's talking about PA pro uh, providers in general, PA should have a place, a seat at that table. Yep. There are many roles, there are very few roles, or you know, like you said, like every facet of medicine, but it's even beyond medicine where we're involved yep. in. I, I, yeah, I, th I definitely think at the very least that extends to all health policy, all government, mm -hmm all real decision-making entities involving patient care or healthcare should have PA involvement. And that is sure. most of the GDP, as a matter of fact. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay, well, I wanna thank you again for your time. I uh, appreciate you meeting with me today and discussing these issues because part of what we've been discussing is just getting that word out, educating other people about what we're about, what we're doing, uh, trying to maybe hopefully dispel some of these misconceptions about what this will all entail. And it doesn't really have the negative implications that maybe some make it out to be, but I really appreciate your time. Uh, it was nice meeting you and thank you for everything that you're doing. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate being here. Um, and, uh, you know, anytime you need any further information, please let me know. And thank you so much for the work that you're doing in particular with pre-PAs and PAs, because I, I really do believe that the advocacy and, and the identity of our profession starts there. So thank you very much.